Professor Jonathan Morris is Research Professor of Modern History at the University of Hertfordshire. He is a specialist in transglobal consumerism and Italy and author of Coffee, a Global History. So what is special about this relationship between Italy and its coffee? Well, I think what's special is Italy, in effect, is the place that's developed the whole of the espresso culture, the espresso beverage. I mean, literally, so the first machines that are ever made that make anything called espresso come out of Italy, and most of the developments in the world of espresso come from Italy. So when I talk about studying Italian coffee, I always divide it into coffee in Italy, which comes from sort of about 1575 through to 1905, and Italian coffee, and that really starts in 1905 when we start talking about Italian espresso machines. As I understand it is that the espresso is quite a recent arrival on the coffee scene. That's right. So espresso, if we take it down to its very basics, which is brewing with pressure, so we only start really seeing pressure brewing machines in Italy that are called espresso in the 1900s. And then it's only from the post-Second World War period, really with the inventions of Achille Gadja, that you see the espresso that we think of as espresso today, the espresso with the crema on top from that high pressure brewing. But I can remember, you know, is that um, there was a you know, Turkish coffee when I was when I was yeah. going up was a tremendously you know, uh, fashionable thing at one point. There was sort of Hungarian style. There was a, a Dow Egbert, so the you know, Dutch coffee. But Italian coffee was the one we kept on coming back to when we wanted to show how sophisticated we were, how we were you know, well travelled, how we cosmopolitan we were. What is it about specifically about Italian culture, Italian coffee that makes it so universally desirable? Well, I think one of the reasons that it's desirable is just because you can see the value in it, in the sense that, in one sense, it looks very sophisticated, the tiny little cup, the espresso cup, and so forth. Also, you've got to use all that big machinery. You know, it's very different from just having to pour something over, a, a, in effect, a piece of filter paper, which is how many coffee cultures make their coffee. So there's something very sophisticated right there. Once we start adding the milk, it's this whole thing about this exoticness of the frothed milk and the way you make beautiful milk. And again, this looks very different from the kind of milk that we would normally have in the home. So Italy has sort of developed a whole set of um, props, almost visual props, There's that a make you enhance the coffee. There's a theater to the coffee, the theater to the preparation. Is this consistent with, with the development of Italian food culture as a whole? Because I think we have this idea that somehow its roots go back into the, you know, into the mists of time. But in fact, it was in the, it, during the fascists that, that, it was, that Italian food culture was consolidated into the form that we now know. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. I mean, one of the things that because um, fascism was uh, very focused on what they called autarky, so using their own ingredients, using their own things, anything that would, there was a big focus on Italian self-production and on therefore the kind of, you know, the various cuisines and turning those into a kind of national cuisine. But it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because in spite of all of this, you know, the, the sense of regionality, of campanilismo in Italy is still extremely strong. Now, does this also apply to coffee? Are there different styles of coffee in Genoa or Naples or Milan or Turin or wherever? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there's differences in the um, the kind of the blend that's used and differences in the way that it's drunk. Generally speaking, you could say in the north we have a uh, much lighter coffee style, mostly, if not entirely, using an Arabica blend. As we move down the country, we move to a darker, heavier style. We also drink the coffee much shorter, so an espresso in the north is going to be significantly more than what you'd get if you asked for a coffee in the south, where you get what we might call a ristretto. Um, and that also in the south, because we have much more robusta in the coffee, uh, that tends to mean that people tend to put a lot more sugar in, whereas in the north, uh, milk is quite often used. And is this a reflection of the social differences between the two, in the, in the sense that uh, Robusto is a much cheaper coffee, rougher coffee, and that's because actually people in the southern Italy are poorer than the people in the northern Italy? Yes, to some extent that's definitely the case, but I think it also fits to taste profiles as well. So southern Italy is not a place where you'd normally see that much use of dairy, particularly milk, mm -hmm. uh, and so therefore there's a sort of a, a movement to coffee. Yeah in that straight form. Uh, and also, you know, it's warmer. So uh, you probably want your coffee short, sharp, because you're just getting it as an energy boost 
or as a digestive. I mean, I think this is one of the, th the key differences between coffee between different, uh, in different contexts, both locally and globally that you know, what you want from your coffee differs. In a way, it fits into, also fits into the gastronomic profile of, of Southern Italy, which where I always think it's further down you go to Italy, the more intense the flavours become. You, know, you begin to get chilies, yeah. and the use of chilies and things like that. Um, and whereas Northern Italy is more influenced by the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it's more sort of broadly, broadly based flavours like that. So you want that sort of hit of coffee, don't you? When you, I mean, I always think the first time I had ristretto, oh, blimey, I mean, it's sort of, <laughs> Not your socks off. That's that's right. And in fact, when you talk about the Austro-Hungarian influence, again, the cappuccino is effectively an Austrian-Hungarian drink. So that the origins of the cappuccino or the cappuccino, which is uh, what's drunk in Vienna, and that's the you know that's why we have the, the cappuccino. So the cappuccino are uh, cappuccin monks, yes. and it's the colour of their robes but it's just the colour of mixing <laughs> milk and coffee, and it's a way of saying, I want my coffee like that. I want it as cappuccino. Yes. So that actually, because Northern Italy becomes under Austrian domination really up until um, unification and indeed after unification, uh, that's where that coffee culture comes through. So again, if we go to Trieste, which is only very recently in historical terms become part of Italy, uh, but that's a huge influence on Italian coffee culture because it was actually the centre of Austro-Hungarian coffee culture. It's the place where Austro-Hungary's imports of coffee used to come. If I remember rightly, is that there was Trieste, Genoa and Naples were the three sort of principal areas of ports well, of landing. Principal ports, yes, definitely. definitely. Yeah. And, and, and coffee cultures grew up around those. It's interesting because I remember getting, when I was in Sicily, you know, everybody seemed to have time, not only to have coffee and a pastry, incidentally, yeah. but also to talk to each other. There was an, almost a sort of, you know, a, a, an African sense of expansiveness of time. Mm. Whereas in Northern Italy, as you say, it's, 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 a, it's a working man's drink. You know, yes. you come in, you have it, and you go, you pop go back off. to work, off, off to work again. They used to say it was the great, um, it was the perfect uh, break because you would, walk out of your office, walk to the coffee bar, you talk on your way to the coffee bar, you have your coffee, you light a cigarette, by the time you're back in the office, you've finished your cigarette and on you go. <laughs> well, happens if you don't smoke anymore? Yeah, well, that, that, this was going to be the great problem, I think. <laughs>